Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chris Ahrens, Managing Editor of Adweek, and we are here for another edition of Adweek Together. This is day four of the series that we've been producing. And this week, we've talked about uh, multiple topics in the industry uh, that has everyone talking, including retail, as well as streaming. And today, we're going to talk about publishing. And I'm very excited to be joined by my colleague, who normally we sit next to each other in the office, but now we're a few states apart, Sarah Jurdy, our publishing editor. Sarah, how are you? Doing well. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing great. Um, so we're, we're also on LinkedIn. And if you, if you see me looking over a little bit every once in a while at my monitor, it's to check uh, the engagement there. We've got uh, about 500 viewers so far. So um, let us know what your comments are, and we'll be happy to um, answer your questions that you have, questions, comments, as we uh, get through today's episode. So publishing, um, lots of things to talk about in the space. Number one, um, some really interesting covers, which we're going to talk about with Sarah, some really interesting uh, platforms and different solutions that some of the publishers are using. Um, but I want to start off by sharing with uh, everybody this ad council spot that was released earlier this week and then talk a little bit about it on the other side. So let's take a look at that. We know that we're asking Americans to do a lot right now. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible to this virus. A question I often get asked is why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. Social distancing is really physical separation of people. It's what we refer to when we ask people to stay at least six feet apart. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants, not going to theaters where there are a lot of people. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others who might actually be infected or infect you. We all have a role to play in preventing person-to-person -person spread of this disease, which can be deadly for vulnerable groups. For more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov. So Sarah, that was from the Ad Council. The Ad Council has been around since World War II, and really its mission is to work with advertisers, video platforms, television networks, to get the message out in times of crisis. So there you saw Dr. Anthony Fauci, uh, Surgeon General Jerome Adams, Deborah Burks, who's on the, on the White House Council of COVID-19. Uh, we wrote about this earlier this week, our colleague Minda Smiley. Talk a little bit about how they work with uh, publishers yeah, I mean, as you said, when crises come around like this, I mean, everyone turns to publishers to really just distribute the information and get the information out there as quickly and most as concisely as possible. So in this case, partners like Facebook and Google, and publishers like Group9 and ad tech firms all uh, agreed to run this sort of PSA. Um, they have said that they would open up ad space on their sites and on their feeds to let this message run. Um, and it really just goes to show you how quickly these publishers and partners can pivot in these times of uh, a global pandemic like this. It's, it's more regional in nature when, when something like this happens or in a time of war, as I said, Ad Council mm -hmm. going back to World War II. Um, but to see it on such a national scale here, um, it's something that really at the end of the day, the publishers are giving their time over to get the message out and it can cost them as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they have chosen to give up the space and almost a pro bono effort to really prioritize getting the information out there. And we'll talk a little bit later about all the different products that these publishers have launched, but really it has been crunch time for all these ad tech partners and these publishers to make sure what they're distributing is accurate um, and information to get there out as quickly as possible. I mean, to look at the timeline of how quickly this has developed here in the US, we're only in what, like the third week of working from home and really tackling this issue as it's spread to homes throughout the United States. So um, this information has had to get out there quickly and this is the Ad Council's response to making sure that that information is out there and provided regardless if they may be taking a hit in digital advertising. Right, exactly. And um, in terms of how you've been covering this working remotely, um, you're a publishing editor, so you've been kind of monitoring what some of the magazines have been doing both on the digital side, but also on the print side, still getting uh, their issues out there. Sports Illustrated had a really interesting cover this week, right? Yeah, their process was um, 
really kind of interesting to take a look at because they had their magazine ready to go um, the week actually that coronavirus hit really spectacularly here in the US. I mean, they had the magazine all designed. They had a cover that was going to feature an NBA player talking about the NBA playoffs. And really within a weekend's time, they had to completely scrap the magazine and redo the cover and a lot of the material inside to focus more on the coronavirus. Um, the cover that you just saw was of an empty stadium that really represented um, how fans had to turn elsewhere um, for entertainment and to consume media once all the different sports games um, were canceled or postponed in that first week that it hit. Um, and of course, these magazines terminal uh, during daytime uh, with light shining through and it was just really sort of captured um, the um, the mood right now in New York City of empty public spaces, empty parks, empty streets. And over this weekend, I know New York City is going to be shutting down several streets and making them pedestrian only. Park Avenue, which is a, a pretty busy thoroughfare on any given day, is going to be shut down around Midtown from about 28th Street to 34th Street and leave it just open to pedestrians. Um, so that's been an interesting um, thing to look at as well. Uh, Time Magazine had a really um, a compelling story that actually had been in the works for quite some time, um, but then they pivoted the, the story behind it. You see Jose Andres, who's the celebrity chef, owns about 26 different restaurants across uh, the country in New York and Las Vegas and, and Washington, D.C. And he's been known in times of crisis to um, convene his World Food Kitchen. And what that does is it sets up uh, you know, food operations to feed those in need. And in the story in time, he talks extensively about um, what, how, how much, how big COVID-19 is, is going to be uh, in terms of being able to, to fulfill his mission of feeding as many people as he can, uh, saying that government alone is not going to be able to gonna take organizations like his, as well as um, uh, other non-governmental organizations to, to sort of get through this. So um, interesting coverage there from different magazines, um, uh, different products. Uh, Sarah alluded to this. She wanted to talk a little bit about uh, different things that some of the publishers are doing, creating new podcasts, creating new offerings for, uh, for, for customers and for clients. If, if a client comes in and wants to, to sort of sponsor um, uh, one of these products, you know, uh, I know our sales team speaking speaking for Adweek is being aggressive and trying to bring in as as many of our community and as many of our clients into different products. This being one of them. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a little pause here for a second. We're going to try to bring Sarah back in and talk a little bit about some of the other topics she's written about, including brand safety um, and and what this might mean for the industry at large considering what the future may bring in terms of layoffs and, and furloughs and things like that and what publishers are doing. So let's take a little break. We'll bring Sarah back in and we'll be right back. And we're back. The Suffolk County, New York Bureau is here. The Cleveland, Ohio Bureau is over here. And yes, there's going to be technical challenges as we work our way through this. So Sarah, welcome back. Thank you so much. Okay. So we were talking about some of the covers. I talked about uh, Time and what they were doing, but Time for Kids is also doing some pretty interesting things as well, right? 
Yeah, so as uh, all of us and some parents start working from home, um, they also have to think about childcare who are also being sent home um, from their daycare centers, from their schools. So time has done something really interesting and focused primarily on that audience. They have opened up their archives for Time Magazine for Kids and are offering that resource available um, to children who are interested in the content that they might otherwise have gotten in the classroom. And um, they're really sort of honing in on that print experience. So when you look at it digitally, you're gonna be able to flip through the pages like you would an actual magazine. Um, but something to keep into consideration when you're home and you're going nuts because the kids coming up and in the background of your Zoom meetings. Um, so between that, I've heard yoga for kids on YouTube. I mean, the options are endless and it's kind of nice to see the publishers get involved. And um, you know, it's an opportunity to reach a new audience and maybe you'll have new subscribers by the end of all this. Exactly, exactly. And another challenge um, or opportunity, depending on how you look at it, um, is brand safety. Um, mm -hmm. been a hot topic for the last couple of years about advertisers and how they're positioned next to certain content uh, and now as, as so much coverage is, is devoted to coronavirus, um, what are you hearing in terms of the people you're talking to about, about those brand safety issues? Yeah, so you almost can't really talk about this lovely ad industry that we're in without mentioning brand safety, uh, can you? But um, that conversation has definitely extended to coronavirus coverage. Um, in what we're seeing in these last three weeks is an extraordinary amount of traffic going to publishers. Um, pretty much across the board, publishers who are investing and creating um, coverage around coronavirus have seen a huge uptick in coverage. Um, I reported last week that Parsley said um, the news shifted from Trump and politics being the main driver of coverage that week and nearly doubled to all things coronavirus. So newsrooms are certainly producing this kind of coverage in waves um, and are doing it to meet audiences because that's what they want to read and consume right now. Um, what the trouble then is how you can capitalize on that traffic. Um, and what we're finding is that brands who are still investing and want to make that investment in digital ad dollars don't want to be around coverage, which is um, a little bit stickier, it's less fun and evergreen as some of that other content. Um, so it's really become a brand safety concern and publishers are left trying to think through how they're able to attract those digital ad dollars um, when most of their coverage is uh, tagged with keywords surrounding coronavirus, where a lot of the newsrooms are devoting their coverage right now. Right. And um, some of the other things concerning um, anybody who works in, uh, well, anybody who has a job, frankly, the concern is, will I have a job six weeks, two months down the road? And that's also true for publishers if you work for an editorial department and some big publishers, digital platforms um, have, have been very open with their employees about this is, this is not something that's going to come and go quickly and we have to make some tough decisions. Can you talk about some of the reporting you've done there about what some of the publishers uh, have decided to do? Yeah, I mean, it's almost a joke at this point, um, talking about how embattled the media industry has become. I mean, they've been at the front lines of all of these changes um, to print advertising as digital ad dollars, also see changes. I mean, the media partners are front in line to watch and have to pivot to see how they're gonna be able to change along with them. Um, so even though we're only about three weeks in, we're already seeing the digital ad dollar shift. And especially given those brand safety issues, the conversation becomes really, sort of muddled and hard to navigate with for publishers who are also trying to cope and deal with the coronavirus from a personal and, and workforce perspective. Um, so I've chatted with and have been chatting with a lot of publishers about uh, what their business strategies look like in dealing with all of this. And honestly, Chris, one of the biggest issues is the timeline is really unknown. Um, I mean, this is three weeks in, we've already seen um, the digital ad industry take a pretty big hit, really big hit to print advertising. Um, and a lot of these buys have already been locked in. So really, you're going to see some big changes in Q2 and, and Q3 once we've been in this for um, some time and we're uh, relying on Zoom conference calls to have that in-person contact and to make those sales pitches and to have those source meetings. Um, so in some respect, it's a, it's a wait and see game to see just how effective these publishers are going to be. 
Um, some publishers have gotten um, what they've said is ahead of the curve to try and protect their businesses as much as they can as we head into this crisis. Um, publishers like BuzzFeed and Future Media Group have gone so far as to tell their staffers that they're going to have to freeze their pay. Um, BuzzFeed in particular has said, depending on the um, salary bracket that you make, that you're going to have your pay frozen until at least May, at which case they're going to then assess it by a month to month basis to see what they might be able to do there for staffers, um, which you know is an interesting business decision. And I think you can discuss and debate maybe what the staff morale then becomes. Um, but it really just goes to show you that all industries are going to be affected by this, media certainly included. Um, and at the end of the day, is it better to have your pay cut by five to 10 um, you know, however much percentage then to go through unemployment and be completely laid off, which is a horrible thing to think of. Um, and it just shows you how quickly this has affected all these industries. We're only three weeks into this and these conversations are already being had. It's true in newsrooms across the country, ours included, um, but not just in the, in the, in the news media the publishing companies, businesses across the country are all having these really tough conversations about how they move forward after this. Um, I just want to make a quick mention as I look over here. Um, we are streaming this out on adweek.com, but also on LinkedIn. LinkedIn's been a great platform for us as well. Just getting a lot of greetings from Nigeria, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, Tehran, Nazu, Brazil, Spain. Thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in and, and trying to um, come together a little bit and talk about these topics that affect our industry. Um, Sarah, talk about, because um, you've been covering this part of it too, some of the other new products and the new platforms. I mentioned when we were in our, before we went to our little pause that this show that we're producing here at We Together is something that we're experimenting with, but, but talk about some of the other things that publishers are doing. Yeah, I mean, I heard, I mean, I mentioned the Time for Kids project. So uh, kids content is something that publishers are getting into and they hadn't necessarily been in this space before, really trying to see what an opportunity for them might be able to lie in with all of these children now at home. Um, we're seeing publishers launch different podcasts associated with um, coronavirus coverage. And nearly all websites and publishers, and including Adweek uh, in this, have put together a live blog sort of tracking how it is affecting the respective industries. Um, especially, you know, it's so important, especially that live blog uh, bit because this information is updating daily and, and by the minute. Um, I think it's also important to note that a lot of these publishers have dropped their paywall so that this information can be accessed for free. Um, and so thinking about from the business perspective, how you weigh monetizing this coverage, but also, you know, just to get that information out there and the importance of that. Um, I think in a lot of ways, that's why media is, is considered an essential business, um, at least in this stage of uh, the coronavirus taking effect here. Um, but, you know, like you mentioned, this show is something that has come together, what, within a week's time, Chris? I mean, you were in charge of that. What did that look like for you? Yeah, it was, um, uh, we started testing it late last week and, you know, using Skype at first and, and trying to stream it out that way. And we have this platform called Wirecast and Wirecast is really dynamic in terms of when it works. It's working pretty well today. <laughs> uh, it's pretty uh, dynamic in terms of being able to switch between two different cameras web cameras, Nick, who's the producer of this, has been producing all week, can roll in different B-roll. As you see um, the stories that come up, that's actually, he's created a digital file for that so that he can insert it into this. Um, yeah, and then, you know, as as we try to do, I mean, the, the, the goal of this was to inform and to educate and maybe even entertain and bring people together sort of in the middle of their day, do it live, um, have that kind of conversation, have the interaction. Um, again, if you have a question, pop it into, uh, to LinkedIn and I'm happy to answer it for you. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all about adapting. It's all about testing. Um, and at the end of the day, if it's, if it's something, you know, that can turn into some, uh, that we use, you know, throughout, even after we get through this, um, I see it as you know, with my background, a great tool to be able to communicate with our audience. Yeah, definitely. I know it's at least nice to kind of just take a break and chat with someone who is not my three-year-old nephew, uh, away from the work for a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. As I said at the, at the top of the show, ordinarily we're sitting right next to each other in the office or desk or adjacent to each other. So it's good to see you, even if it's in a double box or of course on our, our 1030 zoom call in the morning. Um, 
Talk about, I, I know you have another story in the works on alt weeklies, which, you know, yeah. um, are important to a lot of um, big cities uh, in terms of for advertisers to get their message out, but then um, to, to really create a sort of very localized, almost hyper local uh, sketch of what's going on in a certain city. But they're often handed out on the street or in the subways and places like that. And, yeah. and we're not in the subways in the streets these days. Right, right. Yeah, so this is really hit local newspapers and particularly alt-weeklies alt and city magazines really difficultly because um, you know they rely so much on that local advertising. So when these local businesses don't have to advertise that they have events or drink specials, um, those dollars aren't coming in. And we have seen that already hit really hard at alt-weeklies, um, which you know, again, it is just remarkable to me that we're only three weeks in and some alt weeklies have had to lay off 50%, 70%, 80% of staff members who usually are um, producing local journalism around these different community events. Um, and, you know, the local land, local media landscape was already so challenged to begin with. Um, and the thought that we might lose actual partners in um, and players in alt weeklies and local magazines is is really devastating. Um, particularly, I mean, just not from a news consumption level, but an alt weekly or a local magazine is a lot of times how people come together. It's your source of information um, to really, you know, interact with your community in a different way. Um, I was talking with an owner of alt weeklies in several cities throughout the US earlier today, um, who mentioned that uh, days after businesses were asked to, um, you know, close down and go to delivery only, they had a, a huge festival planned surrounding um, a, a fun brunch to get everyone together in the community. It was a ticketed event, and they had hundreds of people already who purchased tickets for that, and they just had to cancel, um, and then had to go and temporarily lay off a few of their staff members. Um, so hopefully and and this one in particular was still hopeful that the that they'll be able to return to business um later this year um but as i mentioned i mean this timeline is so difficult to work with um that publishers are kind of having to really just guess to see when those ad dollars are going to return to the marketplace um i don't know what you've been reading chris but it doesn't seem like until much later this year that that might actually be the case yeah i think that's true i think we're we're you know across industries we're going to get a really good next Friday. We'll get the uh, March unemployment numbers after yesterday, yeah. seeing the jobless claims, which were massive, uh, historic in terms of the size. Um, and then we're going to start getting first quarter, um, or at least quarterly reports at the end of March. And that's really going to set the stage for really what the rest of the year brings. So um, lots to cover here. Um, I want to wrap this up. But uh, before I do, Sarah, um, share with us something, a tip, that sort of gets you through the day. I know you drove back to Ohio last Friday and have been working there all week, be closer to family. So um, what's your tip? Yeah, it's been really helpful being around family. Um, but like you mentioned, Chris, I mean, we sit just a few spaces across from one another and I have a little candy jar that I like to give out. Um, and looking back right now, <laughs> looking back, maybe it wasn't the most healthy thing to make everyone put their hands into the candy jar given this was striking. Um, but I uh, have just tried to surround myself with things that make me smile as much as possible. So I have all my plants here with me from my apartment. Um, so yeah, we're just doing the best we can, aren't we? <laughs> we, we certainly are. Um, all right, we're gonna wrap this up, Sarah. Can't thank you enough for joining us today. I know there's gonna be a lot more to, to follow in your space. So we'll keep looking for your stories on adweek.com. Uh, everybody else, thank you so much for joining us this week in Adweek Together. We're gonna be back next week. Uh, on Monday's show, uh, Stephanie Patrick will be hosting, and she'll be joined by Ko Im, who's our department's editor for Adweek. Uh, Ko is with her family in South Korea at the moment, so we're going to get the the, the um, sort of she's going to be able to set the scene of what's happening in Seoul and in South Korea um, as they sort of come on the other side of the coronavirus crisis. So again, thanks everybody for joining us this week, and we'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. Thanks, Chris.